There we go. There's the mute button unmuting itself. It's been very strange lately. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am your virtual adventure guide here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got a lot of familiar faces in the crowd, but we also have a lot of students joining us for the very first time. And so if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world through over 40 live, free, monthly interactive broadcasts, every one of which goes to our YouTube channel. You can check them out next week. You can check them out five years from now. Whenever you want to watch this program again, share with family and friends, it will be right there for you to do so. Now today, I am so thrilled to continue on with our truly epic Cross Canada virtual road trip. For our students who have had the chance to join us for this, we've been going coast to coast to coast across an amazing country that is Canada. I'm here in Newfoundland, in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. I've had the chance to go coast to coast across Canada, and it is a spectacular country, and I thank you all so much for joining us as we've had the chance to showcase cultural stories, biodiversity, some of the amazing landscapes of this incredible country. Today, we had over 111 groups register from the UK, from across the US, and of course, from almost every province and territory in Canada. So a big welcome to all of you. Now today we are going live to the north. I think when a lot of people think big animals, they think East Africa. They think elephants and rhinos and all these incredible things that we have seen in nature documentaries. But today we are going to have the chance to go to a place in right in our home backyard with muskox and with caribou, with grizzly bears, with more, some of the most incredible landscapes on the earth, and with human habitation having been there for thousands and thousands of years. This is one of the most incredible cultural sites on this planet as well. And today we are going to be joined by someone who is as enthusiastic as I am, which is really hard to find on this planet. Helen Panther is going to join us in Parks Canada for the third straight year in our road trip to take us away. Helen, thank you so much for joining us and uh, welcome to the broadcast. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much, Jesse. And yes, this is my third year, and I'm super excited to be here with you today. And like Jesse said, my name is Ellen Penter. I'm an outreach officer in the beautiful Northern Canada. So I live in Fort Smith, above the 60th parallel in the Northwest Territory. I'm very excited today to be sharing one of the land or one of the park with who I work for. And today I will be joined with, by two of my colleagues that will come and help us teach you and me how to pronounce the traditional name of the places we will be visiting. So I would like to say hi to Tyson and to uh, Dacho. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. I am just going to bring my presentation for you. Give me two seconds and then we can start. I will like to start right here. I'll click the right button. That's going to be better. <laughs> there you go. It's hard to find sometimes, I know. Technology all the time, right? There you go. Now we are going. So you can see here my presentation, Tide and NNA National Park Reserve. And the Tide and NNA area, it's called the Land of the Ancestors. Maybe you like, oh, and I'm not too sure where actually you are situated. But before I even go to there, I would like to acknowledge that today where I am in Fort Smith, I am in Treaty 8 territory. So on the land of Smith Landing First Nation, Salt River First Nation, and the Northwest Territory, Métis. On the next slide, you will see the big family of Parks Canada. All my colleagues, that's where they are working. So every single little dot is a protected area, either marine conservation, a historic site, or a national park. And if you look at the little sun, that's where I am. Uh, the little sun beside the largest national park in Canada, Wood Buffalo National Park. I will stop here for this presentation and I will bring up my other presentation for you. And uh, we will go from there. Give me two seconds. I'm going to manipulate two presentation for you. And then I will take you to um, the Tide and National Park Reserve. 
two seconds. I'm presenting right here. I got it, Jesse. I got it. No, while you're doing that, I just want to note that having done many of these programs in the road trip, you have the best backdrop of anyone. It's an incredible canoe paddle. <laughs> and for those who are really observant, a Star Wars themed fishing rod, which is just incredible. So thank you very much, Helen, for that enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> you are welcome. No worries. That was my little um my little highlight of um um Star Wars month. I had to put it on. There we go. So we are here in the Northwest Territory. So you can see on the screen the four national parks I have the pleasure to work for. So we can see number at the bottom Wood Buffalo National Park. I have the pleasure to work with Nahani National Park Reserve, Natsicho National Park Reserve, and in yellow. That's where we're going to be heading today for Tidenene National Park Reserve. Tidenene, we cannot talk about Tidenene National Park Reserve without talking about the area of the land of the assessor, Tidenene. So basically, as the animation will move on a couple seconds, you will see the protected area around the national park. So Tidenene National Park Reserve was established in August 2019. And it's the core of the Tidenene National Park, Tidenene area. So you have uh, the national park in the middle as its core, and you have those protected area in the surrounding. Parks Canada co-manage the Tidenene National Park Reserve with some surrounding indigenous community. So we are talking about Lutsokedene First Nation, Northwest Territory, Métis Nation, Dinenekwe First Nation, and the Yellowknife Dene First Nation as well. As we travel today, we're going to be traveling through different areas and we're going to have a couple stops along the way. Our first stop will bring us to Great Slave Lake, Grand Lave des Esclaves in French, and um, I will bring uh, Decho and Tyson to teach us or to uh, tell us how do we say Great Slave Lake and Dele Dele Hi. Now, the way you pronounce it in our language is Ucho, which means Great Slave Lake. Or Big Lake. Or Big Lake. Tucho. So, you guys at home, you, oh, at the school, you can help us. To Cho, that's how we pronounce it. Thank you. So to Cho, like uh, um, De Cho and Da Cho and Tyson said, it means big lake, big body of water. Did you know that the Great Slave Lake is the second largest lake in within Canadian border? That's pretty cool. It is also the fifth largest lake in North America and the tenth largest lake in the world that is amazing the great slave lake tucho is very very deep if i was in toronto i will grab the sea entire tower because i'm really strong and i'll put it at the deepest part of the lake you would not even see the tip of the a tower sticking out of the of the water so we are talking about 2000 feet deep great slave lake as water super cold perfect for fishing. This is why I brought my fishing rod right here. Tucho, Great Slave Lake, is known as well for its two arms. So we have the north arm and we have the east arm. Today, our journey will take us towards the east arm, where we're going to travel through one community that we're going to see in a few seconds. Often people that uh, go close to Great Slave Lake will travel in the summer by boat, of course. You can travel by float plane. In the winter, people will travel, local indigenous community or even visitors will travel via snowmobile. Many communities in the surrounding of Great Slave Lake will go on the lake to go fishing and sometimes to go uh, hunting as well. Animals can be seen on the lake. We are talking about ducks. We are talking about great place for fish as well. So I will pause this 
here to second and I will have my first question for you, Jesse. Give me two seconds. I'm just going to pass to this slide and then we can ask the first question to our audience. First, I would like to introduce you to Serena. She is a youth from Lutzoke. You'll see our next uh, stop in our journey. She's 11 years old. She is Denise Linné and she lives in Lutzoke. And I, we have asked her a few questions that we will ask you today as well. So I just wanted to introduce her for a couple seconds before we go and I will let her talk a little bit in this. Hi, Serena. Hi. How old are you? I am Where are you from? I am from the Kajan First Nation. Jesse, did you hear that? Did I click the sound right? Oh yeah, we got the sound. It's a little quieter because she's out on the water, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my first question for you guys is, what species of fish do you think are found in Tucho? Do you have an idea? Ooh. So if you go fishing often, you may have a slight idea. What type of fish? What species of fish? Well, I'm going to head to Mr. Shatter's class, Chalk River, Ontario. What do you guys think? Six, seven, eight. Um, I think pike and bass in the Tucho River. Pike and bass in the normal ones. Uh, Miss Brown's class, I'm going to head to you guys. What do we think? What do we think? Go. Go ahead, sir. I think there would be a large ma large mouth bass. Yep. Anything else? Anything else? Anything else? Ellie, did you have one? CJ? Just yell it out, my mom. Northern Pike. Northern Pike? I will say. Having been to Yellowknife, I had the most delicious fish I've ever had in my life at a restaurant uh, on a great slave lake. So I don't know what it was, but it was amazing. So do tell, Helen. <laughs> yeah, so you probably went to the Bullocks in Yellowknife. That's a place where yes. uh, usually people will go for fish. So let me tell you what kind of fish you can find in Tucho. So somebody said Northern Pike. You are correct. So we can find Northern Pike. We can find lake trout, Arctic grilling, and whitefish, and Cisco as well. That is really known from the people in Lutzoke. Excellent. Thank you. I will bring back my animation for you, and we will be traveling to our next destination, which will bring us to the community of Lutzoke. And that show and Tyson are from Lutz, okay, and that's where they live. So I don't know if we can see their house as we move on. So Lutz, okay, is a small community on the east arm of the Great Slave Lake. That's the only village or settlement into the east arm uh, section. There's about 300 people in Lutz, okay. And Lutzoke, it means place of the Cisco. And we just saw the Cisco little fish where people will go and fish and catch a little bit of that smaller version fish uh, that is called the Cisco. Many, many years ago, around 1925, Lutzoke was known as Snowdrift for the Snowdrift River that, that flows close by, and it was established uh, by the Hudson Bay Company as a trading post. But in 1992, to reflect the Dene or the Dene of this area, they, the name changed back to Lutsuke to reflect the people that are living in Lutsuke. Many people will travel the land in Lutzoke and they will go and travel to the National Park as well, tied in a um, National Park. Um, the Lutzoke and the Dene people of this uh, area and the indigenous community are working very hard to protect tied in NNA, the area and also tied in NNA, National Park Reserve because people from the Suki often will in the summer take the boat or the canoe or the kayak and go paddle and go fishing and of course they do uh, exercise their traditional harvesting which is hunting and also picking berries. 
uh, in the winter, they will use snowmobile to go and travel through the land to go either from some winter camp, cultural camp, or go uh, hunting and go harvesting as well. The community of Lutsoke is accessible by boat or by float plane. Uh, there's no road to connect to this little community of 300 uh, people. So there's no road to go. So the only way to get in is to fly in and uh, or to boat. If you want to go for a long boat ride, you can boat over. I will pause this one and i will ask another question give me two seconds so we have seen the fish here so we have asked serena because she lives in lutsuke as well people from lutsuke go on the land often and i wanted to know how old were you when you travel on the land for the first time for people that are alive with us when did you go in the forest in the bush for the first time how old were you Ooh, i was when i uh, alone in the woods i'm trying to think yeah. i would have been like 13 maybe something like that 11 12 something like that miss crutton's hey. class five sixes if you guys want to unmute we want to say how old you were when you first went outside how long do we first went out in nature by yourself when you were first in nature by yourself I was six. Uh, six years old we have. And then another, uh, go ahead, Lily. Eight. Eight, Bell. I, I guess I was I was, I was was in Toronto. I was bad. I was not as much nature for me to go out into alone. Rich Valley, grade fours, what do you guys think? Have you been already? Well, maybe we can be going in the forest with your friends. Yeah. Take us to the forest. Yeah. Yeah. I was five. Nice. I was yeah, I was five as well. All right. Oh, oh okay. yeah. <laughs> Lots of ages, Helen. So five, five's your youngest so far. It's spectacular. Yes. So when I asked the questions to Serena, of course, she didn't go by herself. She went with other people, but usually like in that range. So we're going to listen to what age she was the first time she went uh, in on the land. How old were you when you first traveled the land? I was eight months. And who did you travel with? I went with my papa and mama. Where did you travel to? I went to um, Hawaii. So she was eight months old when she traveled on the land for the first time with her mama and papa. So she was pretty young and it's not unusual to have younger children going on the land. And as you grow older, that's when you learn from the elders and from your parents, the way of the land or the way of living and some amazing traditional skill you learn as you grow older. Our next stop will take us to a small little area out of the peninsula. So to get there from Lutsoke, we're going to be traveling about 100 kilometers. And Tyson and Dacho, can you help us learn how to pronounce, I think it's called Cache or Reliance? Mm. The way to we pronounce it is Cache. All the way up in yeah, Fort Reliance. Excellent. So we can all say catche. It sounds like there's a T in there. Catche. Thank you. Thank you very much. So catche is our third stop for now. And like I said, it's gonna take us about a hundred kilometers from the community of Lutsoke. And it's the in the north east and it's across a massive peninsula of the east arm towards what often people refer as the charlton bay Cache and reliance is known for his beautiful beaches i heard and also for his crystal clear water over there you can depends of the day you can have massive wave that will rock your boat if you're traveling or you can have days where the water, just like on the picture, will be crystal clear. Like if you were looking at a piece of glass, no wave. Uh, people go to Cache also to go fishing. 
animal can be seen around Cache. We're talking about grizzly bears. We're talking about black bears. We're talking about caribou, lynx, muskox. And uh, also, there used to be a little trading post by the Hudson Bay many, many years ago, uh, about 150 years ago. Nowadays, there's no trading post anymore, but only chimneys that you can see on the picture are the remnants of that small community. There used to be a trading post, uh, and I do believe there used to be a RCMP station and a couple cabin um, along, uh, along the way as well. This is where there's a historic site, the Fort Reliance historic site, and that's where you can see those chimneys as well. People that are traveling from Lutsuki all the way to Kache knows their way around very much. Like I said earlier, they might be crazy a high wave or they might the water might be crystal clear. So they know where to go to navigate safely. And that's something the youth or younger, the children will learn as they travel with their grandparents, with their parents through the land as well. So those are all very good knowledge that are uh, be taught along the way as you travel through the land. And of course, every time you travel, um, which I should have grabbed, but before you travel, usually you do an offering, offering to the river, offering to mother nature, either in form of tobacco or tea to thank mother nature for the travel for offering you if you go berry hunting for the berries or if you go hunting for the meat. And uh, it's a way to give back to Mother Richard. It's, um, it's a way to say thank you. As we move on to our next stop, um, this is an area where you may have it very easy right now paddling along the way and um you know paddling the water was pretty clear but this area it's our fourth stop out of fifth we're almost done but this area is where it's going to build your character it's where really you're going to know what you made for made of and tyson and and that show can you help me pronounce pike's portage it is ka -a. Ka -a. Uh, so we can all say it ka -ka that means pike sportage a lot of travelers explorers a lot of um indigenous community indigenous people from the area will travel pike sportage to get from the boreal forest all the way to the barren land they call it or the tundra Barren land is the area where it's where the tree line stop. That's the area where there's no trees. So we're so used to see very tall and huge trees. As you go up, that's where the tree line is, and that's where there's no stuff. There's no trees. Sorry. Park Sportage Kachekaha. It's one of the historical route that people will travel. You must know that. Pike Sportage is about 38 kilometers from the beach at um, Kachekaha to Artiri Lake, which will take us to our fifth stop. So that's 38 kilometers. But in those 38 kilometers, you will have to do about seven portage. That means you got to carry your luggage from one lake to the other. And of course, the most challenging one is the first portage that you'll have to portage your gear for five kilometers. Depending on how much luggage you have, you may have to do that back and forth and back and forth many times to be able to travel. Of course, you might be very exhausted and you might think this is so hard, but think about this was a historical route, route where people, explorers, and people that wanted to go hunt or go harvesting in the barren land will have to travel this many, many times during a season. So as they were traveling, they will have to carry all their gear as well. So 
as you travel, you may see animal that will come cheer you on a little bit and say, you can do it, you know. So that's seven portage that you will have to go to carry all your luggage this uh, with you. And that route has been traveled by uh, indigenous people for many, many generations as well. The barren land is an important place for the caribou hunting, which is a very uh, important um, food for uh, the Denny people of this area as well. And there is very great respect between the Denny people and the caribou harvesting as well. So often the caribou will be used for meat, but also the fur will be used as well. And every single part of the caribou will be used uh, for subsistence as well. I'm going to pause this animation here and I will ask another question. But this one here, we just saw Sienna, Serena. So we know that people of this area will travel the land many, many times during the season. When school is over and you're like excited for the summer, I want to know what do you do in the summer? And what do you think Serena does in the summer? Do you think she goes on the land or do you think she stay in the community? Okay, so I want to listen to your answer. What do you do in the summer and what do you think Serena does? Well, I'm going to head to Miss Bennett's class in just a yeah. second, the Mates 234. I'll note, and this is a, a, an actual fact, not just for the program. I'm going to a Parks Canada site. I'm going to Gross Moor here in Newfoundland. That's I'm going camping. It's like my first thing when the school year is done. I'm really excited. I hope some of our students are too. But our mate school, 234, what are you guys doing in the summer? Tubing. 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 <laughs> Diving. I love these answers. Uh, Mr. Shadow's class, you guys are back at the camp. Yeah. What are you doing this summer? What are you doing this summer? A lot of fishing, a lot of baseball, and I'm going to be portaging into the Algonquin Park in June. Man, we, we couldn't make up you kids if we tried. You guys are amazing. Uh, nice baseball thing there, too, just saying. Uh, Helen, what, what is Serena going to do? I'm so excited. Let's see what Serena does, but I love all the answers. And I know I was like hanging outside, swinging, playing with friends, biking all over. That's what I did when I was younger <laughs> in the summer. So let's see what Serena has to say. What does she do in the summer? In the summer, what do you do? Um, usually we go hunt um, rabbits. You could go to and you could cook uh, fish in the fire. So she said she goes hunting uh, mainly for rabbit, and then she goes boating and she uh, go and she cook fish on the fire, probably like big northern pike, or she maybe catch some cisco around this area as well uh also now we're gonna move to our last stop it's almost over we have trouble almost the entire park and this will take us to artery lake and i will let that show and tyson tell us how to say artery lake make sure i say it properly oh we may have lost them There you go. There you go. Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. What the heck? Artillery Lake. Uh, how we pronounce that is Edacho Ku. Edacho Ku. Excellent. There you go. Edacho Ku. So, Artillery Lake is our last stop. It is a big, big lake. And it is also known for the area where there's a lot of caribou crossing. Um, Idachoku is also a place close to the tree line. So basically, when we talk about boreal forest, we talk about very tall, tall trees, spruce and leafy trees. But then when we get higher, close to the Arctic Circle, that's where we have the tree line. That's where 
there's no trees at all. It gets so cold in the winter that the tree will not be able to survive. That means the sap inside the tree will freeze and the tree will die. So if picture that, if you were at Archery Lake, you could look on one side and see some trees, and then you will just turn your head and look on the other side and the tree will disappear. There will be no trees at all. So this is the um, area where the tree line will, will start or will stop. And then that's when the barren land will go. So in the barren land, if there's no trees, it gets cold in the winter. People will travel by snowmobiles, skidoos in the barren land to go harvesting their caribou as well. Um, and Artiri Lake, a Dutch quay, and uh, it's a Denny name that means the lake of the big caribou crossing. This gave us a general overview of what Thai Denny National Park Reserve is. There's, we're gonna go back to where we started in Great Slave Lake. And there's another area where it's called the Lockhart River, where it flows from Artillery Lake to Great Slave Lake. And this is very uh, a river, very significant secret secrets for the Denny people. So we're just gonna fly over. It's a beautiful area with many cliffs and waterfall. Often visitors will come visit Tidenene National Park Reserve or Tidenene, and they will go to either Charlton Bay or they will call go to Wilbred Bay, which I heard has amazing fishing and amazing also beaches where people can go uh, hang around too. One geological feature that is super amazing in Tidenene National Park Reserve is the esker, which may not have a picture, but I have a picture with me here so you can see. So basically it's a big piece of um, big piece of rock and I will just pause my animation here as we look at my picture. And often it's made of sedimentary rock and uh, usually sand and gravel. And that is the perfect area for animal to go from one places to another. This is very an amazing uh, geological feature that we can see all over the park as well. I had one last question that I asked Serena before we finish and I would like to ask it to you as well. Give me two seconds. Oh. Did you do any all right, wrong one. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <a point. laughs> this one. What do you like oh. about Tide and any National Park Reserve? So after you have seen a little overview of the park, what do you like about the park? Is there something that strikes you and say, oh, that's what I like about the park? We're going to head to Miss Brown's class first to chime in, and then Miss Cruttenden's class after that. YouTubers, you guys have been doing amazingly in the chat as well. But Miss Brown, Brown, so far, so far. Any jump in line? Jump in line. Anybody? The nature. The nature. The nature. That's what jumps in line for me. I like that. And then our Cruttenden crew, five sixes. What do you guys think? It's peaceful. It's peaceful. peaceful. <laughs> Peaceful and nature. That honestly, it's just such incredible wilderness. There's so much space. I grew up in a big city with three million people, and so it's just incredible. Uh, so I, I love these answers, guys. Helen, anything else to chime in on before we dive in with QA? <laughs> yeah, so basically tied in Indian National Park Reserve, like you said, it's nature and it's huge park as well. So People can travel and basically you can travel for days without seeing anybody, but the scenery, the geology and nature on itself, it's like so calming and the serenity is very there and you can see tons of wildlife as well, which is amazing. So I asked Serena this last question, what did she like about Tide and NNA National Park Reserve? And here is. What do you like about the site in the park. Um, it's fun. It's 
And? Uh, you could um, go completely around here. And fishing, or you could go um, get Cisco in the summer. Around the night. So. so she said it was fun. And she likes to go boating. And she likes as well um, going and fishing some Cisco in the summer. So thank you very much for joining myself, Tyson, and Dacho today. And we are ready for your questions. Well, thank you so much, Helen, Dacho, Tyson, for an incredible program today. Serena, uh, again, kudos for doing, getting involved in that. I know it's a little nerve wracking being on camera, but being willing to take part in something like this is so extraordinary. Again, over 2,200 students registered for today's program from all over the world. So a big welcome to all of you as well. Um, I will note too, I'm really sorry about that last bit trying to bring in Dacho and Tyson. My computer freaked right out trying to bring them in. So. I apologize for that. Um, I'm actually going to start with a question for you two gentlemen, uh, and then we're going to go to Mr. Shadis' class first for some live questions. We might go a little long. But Dacho Tyson, uh, one thing that a topic of ours that we've been really featuring and exploring by the Seed Your Pants all year is climate change, biodiversity loss, how landscapes are changing around the globe. And I think a lot of people in the Toronto, Montreal, big cities of the world, we started to see this in a big way, but there's still a disconnect thinking about places that are so like so much wilderness, so peaceful, so full of nature and how they've been changing. Have you two noticed any changes in the landscape in these parks uh, since you were kids growing up there? <clears throat> well, just not, not, well, just a little bit because of the wildfires that like 10 years ago, nine years ago at least. And yeah. Yeah. Did you notice any change? Overall in the landscapes, um, other than like what he already addressed about forest fires, um, from climate change and such, basically just, I've seen the water levels go up and down a few years, but I think that's just, in, goes on with time. Um, as for animals and such, um, uh, over the course of a few years, I noticed that some numbers have gone a little low, but uh, this is why it makes this park so important for sustainability and preserving the, the animals, land and water so that, you know, for future generations to come. So, uh, yeah, that's a few things that I've noticed and changes. Marvelous. Thanks, gentlemen. And wildfires is something that we've heard a lot in our Alberta and BC parks as well. We've actually had a whole programs on that uh, as an issue. So I really, again, encourage our audience to check out our YouTube channel if you're keen on more of that. But thank you, gentlemen, for that. Uh, as we dive in with Q&A, I will note, uh, if any of you have questions for Dacho and Tyson, please do let me know. Uh, we're going to head to Chalk River first. We're going to go a little long today because we're rebels and there's so many of us and we just have all the questions, which is great. Uh, Mr. Chad is class. Hey, Carter, come on in, man. Come on in, man. Oh, yeah. Um, what made you get so interested in all this stuff? Ooh, Helen. Ooh, Helen. Well, I must, I, I, I always say, you know, when you're passionate about something, you, uh, you learn, you want to learn more. And I am passionate about my work here at Parks Canada. And I work for four parks, so I learn so much new knowledge. And I'm always, I always say, you know, you meet some people or you go to some areas, some landscape or some park in your life. And maybe when you go, you meet these people, you you know, maybe you don't know that they're going to have an impact on your life. And through the course of my life, I have met many, many people that changed my way of seeing life and seeing nature and learning how to go in the bush and looking at the plant, looking at the tree, looking at what's surrounding us and finding very like comfortable for me. But also I want to learn about all that. I want to learn about all the plants. I want to learn about everything so I can share all that knowledge with you guys and everybody as much as I, I want. So I'm really, I like learning and I like sharing everything that I learned. 
And it's the uh, National Park System, so it's like the greatest places in the world. And as you said, getting out and seeing it is such a big part of this. Serena's lucky enough to be going out at eight months, which is incredible. Um, but no matter what age you are, if you get out and experience nature, if you're in a, a really special place like we've had the chance to showcase today, if you're in the heart of a major city, there's so much to discover and explore. And I think that's such an important way to start uh, people's curiosity. Ms. Brown's class, grade five, ever for well. If you guys want to come on in, you are good to go. Good to go for a question. Okay. Got anything? Um, uh, how, <coughs> I don't know. What's your question? How is the weather like in the winter time? Ooh, what's the Ooh, what's the very cool up there? Good question. Um, compared to I was in the south, so uh, we are really in the north, so our weather is a little bit more dry than humid. But in the winter, it depends where you are. It could be minus 30, it could be minus 40, it could be minus 50. And if you think about it, when you get to the tree line and above, where there's no tree, so if it's super windy, it's going to get very cold, minus 16. It could be minus 70 degrees Celsius. So people will learn to bundle and put many layers to keep them, themselves very, very warm in the winter time. I'm a I was a tremendously nerdy kid, and I can tell you that the coldest temperature ever recorded in Canada was in Snag, Yukon, and I think it was negative 66, but I could be wrong, 72, one of the two. So check that out when you're done. It's too cold, much too cold. Miss um, Cruttenden's class, five sixes, come on in and uh, go for it, guys. Okay, here's our question. So are there any invasive species in Tucho? I love this question. This is a very good question. So for invasive species are you talking more about fish or are you talking more about plants uh, either or helen Anything either or. so i think they might be i'm not a hundred percent sure maybe i can see if tyson and that show has any idea i will say potentially sometimes there's some um oh i forgot the name those thistles that are invasive species that I found in this area. But uh, do you have thistles around Tucho? Any invasive species, anything that shouldn't be there that's in the lake? Oh, um, not that I know of. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't know. Well, I don't think it. Yeah, we can check into that too. This is like a, a question off the cuff that can be challenging. So I'll see if there's any invasive species in and around the park and we can try and get that to class after the fact too. But uh, and, we, and, and we have to think that the lake is quite cold. So 10 degrees Celsius is about the uh, temperature of the water. So if there's any invasive species, they have to survive in very cold water. Yeah. I will note in the winter, having been there in March to Yellowknife, that there's literally like they make roads on the ice that big trucks yeah. drive on and planes land on the lake. So it's very, very cool. It's a spectacular part of the world. Um, we're going to head to Rich Valley grade fours and then Mapes two, three, fours. I'll take a few YouTube questions and then we'll wrap up after that because time flies and you're having fun. Uh, but Rich Valley, come on in grade fours. What's the largest fish ever found in Canada? The <laughs> biggest oh. fish in the history of Canada. Mm. I will say probably not the one I fish because my family like fishing. I just observe. But I know some of the fish that have been caught in Tucho, Great Slave Lake, cool. they were between 10, 15, but I think the biggest was 25 pounds. Uh, but I don't know across the country which was the biggest one, but 25 pound fish is quite a big fish, I will say. Oh, fish. Was, would that be our northern pike that you highlighted in the fish picture? Yeah. I believe it was, yes. Excellent. All right. Uh, by the way, the emphasis on this program from our students on hunting and fishing, we've got so many kids that do this as part of their life, is so unusual and so fantastic. So I'm really glad we've got a lot of really keen nature kids out there getting out and exploring uh, the land and its wildlife. Mapes234, I'm heading to you, and then we're going to take a few YouTube questions to wrap up, everybody. Hey, guys. <laughs> Right where I am. Hi. 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 Back up a little bit, Lily. Yep. There we go. There we go. <laughs> look up. Look up. What's the most endangered species? Ooh, the most endangered species in the park, Helen. No pressure. 
Indeed, species. I will have to have a look. I know some, for example, some caribous are endangered species as well, even though there's quite a bit, depends in which area you are. I know few plants are uh, classified as endangered species, but this is a very, very good question. I may have to have a look to uh, draft a list of those uh, endangered species close to uh, uh, Titan in any national park reserve. I'll have to have a look. I want to know too. I just my, my birthday was like a couple weeks ago, and I got Frozen Planet Two from the BBC on that, and they featured a bunch of stories from the Northwest Territories talking about yeah. uh, caribou populations there. They had a Wood Buffalo National Park just south yeah. of that original slide, highlighting the wolves. So there's some really incredible animals that aren't endangered, but they're under threat. Their populations are being reduced in a lot of ways, and so it's one of the big challenges is that these northern untrammeled wildernesses are still being yep. affected by our actions in a really big way so i encourage people to check out that documentary check out the amazing work on parks canada too they highlight a lot of their red list species so endangered vulnerable concern uh and you can check that out when you're done the broadcast as well i've got a question for dacho and tyson from our folks on youtube they wanted to know i'll, I'll put it up on the screen so you gentlemen can see as well uh they wanted to know uh if there's a difference between denisolin and dene people um as terms hmm if there is a difference between Denisov's people and Dene yeah or if it's the same and just a different term for it uh I believe it's the same thing uh as in terms but for context and such yeah I think that it just it's different yeah. pronunciation of how the word is Fantastic. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mr. LeBron Stas, joining us in Mississauga. We've got groups in Winnipeg, Charlotte Lake. We've got all over Ontario, uh, Brampton, and more. Um, I'm going to take a couple more quick questions, and then we'll wrap up from there. Uh, let's see. Oh, we've got more endangered species questions. Let's see. Oh, grade one students in Miss Gale's class want to know, Helen, if we found any fossils of extinct animals, dinosaurs, or the like in these amazing parks. Hmm. That will be awesome if we can go and find dinosaurs. So far, we haven't found dinosaurs, but often there will be fossil in the rock, in the surrounding. Like I show you a picture of an asker, there will be some gravel, some pebbles, some rocks over there. And through the ice age, there were some animals that were left behind and sometimes they are carried from one area to the others. So it could be possible to find fossils of um, little creatures over time. Not sure about dinosaurs. As far as I know, I haven't seen any bone or heard. But if they found dinosaurs, I will be the first one to go run over and that's our to. that's our broadcast next year from with you as we'll talk about the fossils <laughs> in these amazing parks. Um, Helen, Dr. Tyson, thank you all so much for an incredible broadcast today. I want to note again, if you want to check out our Cross Canada virtual road trip, the link below uh, will take you to the entire list of programs to come. We've got at least three more broadcasts coming in the next few weeks and a French program of this in just over an hour. So we really encourage you to tune that in and share with your colleagues and friends. We do this Cross Canada virtual road trip in conjunction with the amazing team at Canadian Geographic, which have an incredible contest on the go. You can win some really amazing prizes just by highlighting what you learned in today's program so i'll make sure everybody gets that link at the end um a huge thank you to all of you again check us out at exploring by the seat of your pants check out the full uh series broadcast and uh we what we do to end every broadcast helen you know this dr tyson it's your first time i'm going to bring in mr shattuck miss brown miss crutton and rich valley and make school to say a big thank you to everyone uh you're all in the broadcast we really appreciate you <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Bye for now, everyone. Nice. Right. Right. Oh, say farewell. We'll end it.